Let's uh, want to pray for, uh, as we see on the screen, we stand with Israel and we need to continue to pray for them uh, as they're winding things down with Gaza and Hamas. Hezbollah is threatening uh, to preempt a war against them, so uh, that could be heating up here pretty quick. So we want to keep Israel in prayer. And um, our distinctives class, going through what Calvary Chapel believes, why we believe it. There's a lot of doctrinal and theological things in that as well, but uh, we started last Wednesday, got through the first three lessons, and that was the longest class. So this week we'll go through chapters uh, lessons four and five, empowered by the Spirit and building the church God's way. So um, it's not too late to sign up for that and uh, show up for that. That'll be at 6.30 here in the sanctuary. Uh, they have the distinctive books and workbooks in the um, bookstore here. If you want to get a copy and, and join us, that would be great. Um, the uh, Go Give Hope food uh, trailer is going to be serving hamburgers starting at five o'clock Wednesday. So um, you can come out for that as well. So anyway, let's open up in a word of prayer and uh, we continue our study or start our study, not continue, but start our study here in the book of Acts. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, once again, we thank you for your word. Uh, we pray that we would glean all that you have for us. We would grow in our relationship with you and with one another. We pray that your Holy Spirit would teach us from your word, and Lord, thank you that the book of Acts is really the Acts of the Holy Spirit, and we pray that we would um, lean into you and grow in our understanding of what you want to do in us and through us for your glory. Father, we pray for the youth group as they are driving back. We ask that you would give them traveling mercies, keep them safe in the road. Uh, thank you for all that they've been able to experience down in Mexico. And we just pray that your hand would be upon them and lives would be changed and that they would see uh, your plans and purposes for each one of them. And, and Father, we do pray for the peace of Israel and Jerusalem. We ask that you would watch over them, uh, open up their eyes to see that you are their Messiah, Jesus. Help them to realize that you love them and you are protecting them. And we do pray, Lord, that you would come against the enemy in all the ways that he's trying to steal, kill, and destroy uh, your people and the nation of Israel. But your word tells us that those promises to the Jews in the last days and to Israel as a nation are still valid. And we pray, Lord, that you would continue to work in a wonderful way, in a powerful way in their midst. And that, as Ezekiel says over 60 times, that they would see that you are the Lord. And so, Father, we pray that you would give us ears to hear what your spirit is saying to us now as we go through this amazing book of Acts, and it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Turn with me to the book of Acts. Uh, it's one of the most dynamic books in the Bible. As we'll see, this is the sequel to the Gospel of Luke, as, in, uh, as this is the case with the other synoptic Gospels of Matthew and Mark. Luke uh, ends with Jesus' resurrection and then his ascension up into the you know heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father. Now in the Gospel of Luke, we see the birth of Christ, the ministry of Christ, uh, the sermons of Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection. Uh, we see how he commissions the disciples to take the gospel message to all the nations. But he also tells them they cannot go out until they are filled with the Holy Spirit. They must receive the promise of the Father, which is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and so one of the last things Jesus tells them to do is to wait in Jerusalem until they are endued with power from on high. Now, power is one of the major themes in the book of Acts. Uh, through the 11 apostles and also through the 120 disciples that we'll see are gathered in the upper room, uh, Jesus would use these dedicated men and women to literally uh, turn the world. Uh, Acts 17 says they were turning the world upside down but they're actually turning it right side up as the gospel is going forth and many people are getting saved. The gospel would go throughout the known world in about 30 years, and that's without radio, that's without TV, that's without the internet, that's without all these modern technological things that we think we need to have to proclaim the gospel. But they simply were filled with the Holy Spirit, with the love of Jesus, and with the power of the gospel they took 
the word of God out to those who were pagans at the time. You know, Paul says in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, for the Jew first, and also for the Greek. And, and we'll see many examples of God's power at work as we go through this book. You know, we'll see various healings and miracles taking place. We'll see the apostles persecuted simply because they were telling people about Jesus. Um, but God will bless them. He will protect them until he says it was their time to die, uh, to become martyrs. Now, here's something to think about as we go through the book of Acts. It covers a period of about 30 years from Jesus' ascension around 32, 33 A.D. until Paul is arrested. He was in Rome. He was arrested there around 62 or 63 A.D., so about a 30-year period. And the, the interesting thing is the book of Acts records about 30 miracles. So you can average it out to about a miracle a year. And so I say that because a lot of people have the understanding like, wow, the first century church was so powerful and full of miracles. Why don't we see those things today? As if to say, miracles are happening every time they turn the corner. Oh, go to the temple, miracle. Well, that happened once in chapter 3. Oh, they go to the supermarket, miracle. Oh, they go to McDonald's, miracle. And everybody's all excited about all these miracles we see. But again, it's about you know one every year on average that is recorded for us. But the reality is their lives are the same as ours. God took very ordinary people, mostly fishermen, the apostles, and he did extraordinary things through their lives simply because they were sold out to Jesus. In all the years that I've been a Christian, I've seen, I've heard, um, I've been a part of many miraculous things. You know, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. When we see what's going on in Northeast India, when we go there, we see God doing miraculous things all the time. It's like the book of Acts there. And so we need to be careful not to think that God only worked powerfully back then in the first century. Not at all. God is still moving powerfully throughout the world today. Whenever and wherever God's people are sold out to Jesus, whenever they've forsaken the things of this world and are walking in the power of the Holy Spirit, that is when people will recognize what God is doing in their midst. But when people, especially in the Western cultures, are living in compromise to the Word of God, then they don't recognize, they don't see what God is doing throughout the world today. So we'll see a lot about God's power, but another thing we'll see in this book is it's really a pattern. And I talked about this on Wednesday night. Book of Acts is really a good pattern for the church. Uh, it was very simple. They simply relied upon the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. Uh, they were breaking bread together in fellowship, praying together. Very simple. You know, that first century church kept things really simple. Today, most churches become way too complicated. Too much focus is placed on having the right programs, having the right technology, being healthy and wealthy, and any other thing other than the Word of God. We've replaced a simple teaching and preaching of God's Word with worldly pop psychology, which is happening all around us. I shouldn't, shouldn't name names, but, you know, Joel Osteen. Um, fleshly gimmicks, all these different formulas, man-made formulas to try to draw people in. But the result is the church is, especially again in the Western culture, is very anemic, it's very weak in its witness of Jesus Christ. And so we'll see the, the beautiful yet simple pattern that every church really should follow. Uh, it's just the Word of God. The Holy Spirit of God takes the Word of God and He changes the people of God. Now we'll also see that even in the first century, the church not only had power, this is a great pattern, but they also had many problems. You know, a lot of times we idealize the first century church. Oh, man, those guys are just so amazing. They were floating off the ground. You know, they had halos over their head. No, they were simple human beings. They were sinners saved by grace. In fact, they were so far from perfect that within 60 years after the day of Pentecost, Jesus writes seven letters to the seven churches you can find it in Revelation 2 and 3, his seven letters to the seven churches. In five of the seven letters, he rebukes them. He calls them to repentance because they were already blowing it 60 years after the day of Pentecost. In fact, to the church of Laodicea, which represents the last day's church as well, Jesus is on the outside of the church, knocking on the door, hoping somebody would open the door and let him back into his church. 
because they had driven him out. Revelation 3.20 says, Behold, this is Jesus speaking, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. You know, again, there's a lot of churches like that today. They don't teach God's word. They, they tell people that Jesus is not the only way to heaven. They'll say that all roads lead to heaven. No, all roads lead to the great white throne judgment. There's only one road that leads to heaven, and that's Jesus, who said, I am the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And so there's no such thing as a perfect church because a genuine church is filled with forgiven sinners who love Jesus. That's what the church is. We're called to be the pillar and foundation of truth. We need to be a place of grace and mercy and love and compassion. This is a refuge for saints. It's also a hospital for saved sinners. Too many churches today are just making it comfortable for sinners to hang out and do their own thing and not change. That's not what the church is about. The, the pillar and foundation of truth is this is sin. This is God's righteousness. You better get right with God or you're not going to go to heaven. And there's too many churches that try to placate the, the sinful people that come and they don't ever tell them the gospel that they need to repent and get right with God. And so we're, we're seeing so many weird things going on in the church today. It's really, really sad. It's really grieving the Holy Spirit. We'll see that later on in this book as well. Again, we understand nobody's perfect, but Jesus is perfect. He's the head of this church. And when we start looking at people around us the way God sees people, then we will have that heart of love and compassion and speak the truth in love because we want to see them get right with God. So you can basically break Acts into two main sections. The first section deals primarily with Peter and you know the role that he will play in the early church. And then the second part is mostly dealing with the Apostle Paul. Once he gets saved, then God will use him in tremendous ways. So let's pick up in Acts chapter 1, look at verse 1. It says, The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began to both do and teach. So what's the former account? The Gospel of Luke. Uh, Dr. Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke. He wrote the book of Acts. In fact, he wrote more words in the New Testament than even Paul did. Paul wrote more letters, but combined Acts and Luke, are, are it's a big section of your New Testament. So the former account is what Dr. Luke wrote, the Gospel of Luke, and he dedicates both of these books to a man named Theophilus. Theophilus means a friend of God. A friend of God. If you're a Theophilus today, then this book is for you as well. There's a guy named Theophilus. Um, it was rumored that I was almost named Theophilus when I was uh, a baby, you know, when I was being born. You know, my parents had, you know, a tough time coming up with Jeff. So the doctor suggested Theophilus. And so why would we name him Theophilus? And the doctor said, well, that is the awfulest looking baby I've ever seen. <laughs> Just kidding. But if you're a Theophilus, <laughs> then this book is for you. So look at Luke chapter 1. On the screen here, verses 1 through 4, it says, inasmuch as, have, inasmuch as have many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered, to, uh, delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of, of all things from the very first to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus, that you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. Again, it's obvious that Luke did a lot of research. He interviewed eyewitnesses. That would be the apostles. It's all these different brethren that were there. Um, you know, there's a lot of disciples that he would have interviewed. I'm sure he interviewed you know, Mary, the mother of Jesus, and so forth. Uh, in addition, Luke had firsthand knowledge of many of the things he wrote about in the book of Acts because 
And about halfway through, it goes, you know, and they did this, he's writing, and they did that, and they went here, they went there. And then all of a sudden it says, and we went here, and we went there, because he joined up with the Apostle Paul in many of Paul's adventures. And he was Paul's personal physician. I guess if you're going to be beat to death and stoned and left shipwreck and, you know, beaten with rods and so forth, it'd always be good to have your personal doctor with you. And so here we have the official count here in the book of Acts of how the church was born, how it began. Now, notice also here in verse 1 in Acts 1, Luke says his gospel account about Jesus dealt with what Jesus began both to do and to teach. But the book of Acts deals with what Jesus is continuing to do and what he's continuing to teach because he is working through the body of Christ. After all, Jesus is still alive. So it didn't end with Jesus ascending. He says, I'm going to leave, but I'm sending you the Helper, the Holy Spirit, and he is going to bring to remembrance all the things I said to you, and he would continue to work through all these you know, amazing people, these men and women, the first century church. Now, in the Gospels, we find the apostles, for the most part, were confused, they were scared, they were timid, and yet we see a radical change take place as we get into the book of Acts, especially on the day of Pentecost. How did they go from being afraid and timid, hiding in fear, to being these lean, mean preaching machines? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came upon them in power, and as a result, God used them in tremendous ways. The good news is He's continuing to change people today. He's continuing to use people just like you and me who humble ourselves before God and say, Here I am, Lord. Fill me with Your Spirit. Give me compassion for the lost. Help me to be a vessel of honor for Your glory. So again, Verse 1, the former account they made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. What a glorious 40 days that must have been. From pa Passover when he died to Pentecost when the church was born, it's 50 days. So Jesus was dead, buried in the tomb for three days. He appears to them for 40 days. And so when he instructs them before he ascends up, they've got seven days to wait for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. But notice again, it says he gave them many infallible, that means unmistakable proofs. What kind of proofs? Well, from the very moment he rose from the dead. He appeared to Mary Magdalene. He appeared to the other women. He appears to Peter. He appears to the two men walking on the road to Emmaus. Uh, later that evening, he comes into the house <laughs> without knocking on the door or even opening the door. He just goes into the house, walks through the walls, and there he is. He says, don't be unbelieving, but believe. And, you know, see the nail prints, Thomas? This is a week later. See the... The, the hole in my side, don't be unbelieving, but believe. That's when Thomas says, my Lord and my God. He appeared to them. He went up to the Sea of Galilee, and he made breakfast for him up there in the Sea of Galilee. You know, for 40 days, he made himself, um, you know, not made him, he was real to them. He, he showed up, and he ministered to them, and it was just an amazing time. And then here, we're going to see him ascend uh, later on in this chapter. So Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, 6, that he appeared to over 500 brethren at one time. So we don't know when that took place, but at one point in those 40 days, he appeared to 500 people. He wasn't a ghost. He wasn't a phantom. He wasn't some mirage. It was Jesus raised from the dead. And so there was absolutely no doubt in their minds that Jesus was truly alive. Now, as we study the book of Acts, we'll see that his resurrection is the central theme in every message that is given. And we'll see the gospel presented many times, and it's always emphasizing the resurrection. Because without the resurrection, there is no hope. Without the resurrection, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, without the resurrection, we are of all people most to be pitied. Might as well eat, drink, and be merry. Tomorrow we die. But because of the resurrection, we have that living hope that we will be raised up from the dead, and we will see him face to face. 
Now, notice what Jesus taught them during the 40 days after his resurrection. Here it says, he spoke of things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So what's that all about? The kingdom of God. It's a wide-ranging topic because there's basically two kingdoms of God that parallel each other. There's the physical, literal kingdom of God that Jesus is going to establish on earth in the near future. After the rapture, we got the great tribulation for seven years. At his sec second coming, he comes back. He establishes his kingdom on earth where he will rule and reign from the Temple Mount in Jerusalem for a thousand years. He's going to take this world that's devastated. He's going to make it like the Garden of Eden. It's when the lion lies down with the lamb. And it's not because he wants lamb chops. It's they're at peace with one another. It's going to be like the Garden of Eden all over the world. There's going to be peace. There's not going to be any wars. He's going to eradicate all diseases. He will restore the whole world. And it's going to be beautiful beyond we can you know, understand, but the kingdom of God also speaks of a spiritual kingdom that is happening right now. Jesus is the head. He is the king of kings, the Lord of lords. His spiritual kingdom is always growing because anytime somebody gets saved, you enter into the kingdom of God. And so he is in our midst. The kingdom of God is slowly but surely spreading because more and more people are getting saved. And that kingdom is made up of men and women, boys and girls, who receive Jesus into their hearts as Lord and Savior. So, the two different kingdoms. One is literal when he comes back. They're both literal, but one is literally physical on earth. The other one is spiritual that is growing even today. Now, this must have been an amazing Bible study because for 40 days he's with them and he's speaking of these things pertaining to the kingdom of God. What, what an amazing scene that was. Now, look at verse 4. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for, notice, the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So this takes us back to Luke 24, verse 49, where Jesus said, Behold, I send the promise of my Father, notice, upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. So the promise of the Father refers to the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that will take place once and for all on the day of Pentecost. John chapter 14, verses 16 to 18, Jesus describes this event like this. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that's the Holy Spirit, that he may abide with you forever, the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. So from these two verses in Luke and John, we have this threefold ministry of the Holy Spirit and the function that he plays in the world today in people's lives. First of all, Jesus said the Holy Spirit would be with you. Then he would come in you, and then he would come upon you. There's three very distinct ministries of the Holy Spirit. Uh, the Greek word is para, where he's with, same as the Spanish word para. He's with everybody in the world. He's convicting the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. He was the one, when I was sitting there at Calvary Chapel, San Diego, as a lost sinner, he was the one zinging me with all these darts from the gospel being spoken. You're a sinner, Jeff. God loves you. Jesus paid the price for your sins. You need to turn your life over to him. That's the Holy Spirit on the outside just pointing us to Jesus, convicting us of sin. And then he comes in our lives, and then he will come upon our lives. So he's the one that's always pointing out to unsaved people their lost condition. Now, he was the one who caused you to realize, I need forgiveness. I need uh, eternal life. I need to be restored. I need to have purpose for living. I need Jesus. And so again, he's with everybody. The second ministry is, is when a person does humble themselves and come to Christ they ask him to be, you know, their Lord and Savior. He comes in us. Uh, the Greek word is en. It's like our in. He comes in us. 
And at that very moment he comes into our lives, radical things take place. You are, first of all, sealed into the body of Christ. At that very moment of salvation, he seals you. He places God's stamp of ownership upon your life. He has redeemed you through the blood of Jesus. You've now been bought with a price. You've been transferred from darkness to light, from death to life. That's an instantaneous thing that happens at the moment of salvation. He re regenerated us. He, that's when he breathes the life of God into us. We're born again. He sanctifies us. It means he sets us apart for God's exclusive purposes. You know, we are justified. God now sees you at that moment of salvation just as if you'd never sinned. And the list of all that he does for us at that very moment of salvation is a long list. But the bottom line is, if you're a Christian, the Holy Spirit is living inside you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. In fact, there's not any true Christian in the world that has not received the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The Apostle Paul is very emphatic about this. Look at this verse in Romans chapter 8, verse 9. Paul says, But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. In other words, if you don't have the Holy Spirit, then you don't belong to Jesus. So when did these disciples, these apostles, receive the Holy Spirit? They received the Holy Spirit before Pentecost. They received the Holy Spirit after Jesus rose from the dead. And in John chapter 20, verse 22, this is what we read. This is when the Holy Spirit came into their lives. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. And so at that moment, they were officially born again. They became new creations in Christ. Luke tells us at that moment, then the scriptures came to light. In other words, they understood what the scriptures said at that very moment. But then, as we see here in Acts chapter 1, verse 4, there's a subsequent work of the Holy Spirit. That's ministry number 3, where he would come upon you. The, the Greek word is epi, epi. He comes upon you. So a simple way to illustrate it is if you have an empty glass of water, you turn on the spigot, okay, there's the water. That's the Holy Spirit pouring into the sink. And so here you are without the Holy Spirit. So you stick it under the water, you pull it out, the Spirit's in you. Always will be. To have Him upon you, you stick the cup, the glass under the faucet, and you leave it there. It fills up, quickly fills up, quickly overflows, and that's what he's referring to, the overflow of the Holy Spirit. Jesus calls this the rivers of living water that will flow into our lives, out of our lives. That's when we are usable for the kingdom of God. That's what the Lord does in us and through us. Now, look at verse 5 once again. It says, For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. What is baptism? Well, it means to be immersed. Uh, some churches will sprinkle, some will just kind of pour a little water over their head, but it literally means you're immersed. Uh, John the Baptist, when he was baptizing people at the Jordan River, immersed them, and it was a baptism unto repentance, preparing their hearts for the coming Messiah. So even John said of Jesus, I indeed baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Now, Jesus is telling his disciples here in Acts 1.5 that this will take place not many days from now. Again, about a week after he ascends is when the day of Pentecost will take place. Immersion. Baptism comes from the Greek word baptismo, and it, it referred to dying garments. So if you were going to take, you know, plain, you know, white garments, but you wanted them to be vibrant and, and you know, beautiful, then they would, you've seen tie-dye t-shirts and so forth, they would dye them. They put them in this dye, and when you pulled that shirt out that was white, now it's just full of that color, whatever was in the dye. So now when you're baptized in Jesus by the Holy Spirit, you might go in plain, you come out, reflecting Jesus, dripping with the characteristics of the Lord, because it's the Holy Spirit now working in you and through you. A beautiful picture of what Jesus does with all of us. Now, you were changed when you came up, not out of the water, but when you came up 
being filled with the Holy Spirit. This is where a lot of people have been confused over the years. Uh, this is where a lot of people have been misformed, and thus many have been scared off from experiencing the Holy Spirit in their lives. Um, I've been turned off of a lot of things that people say, oh, this is the Holy Spirit at work. And it's like, no, no, no. If it doesn't line up with Scripture, don't buy into it. I talked about this uh, Wednesday night. There's no spiritual or scriptural evidence for being slain in the Spirit. Man came up with that, not God. There's no, you know, scriptural evidence of somebody being Velcroed to the wall or to the floor. I've heard that people describe it that way. That's not biblical. It's, you know, rolling around like a fish out of water, flopping on the ground. That's not biblical. That's not what the Holy Spirit does. We go by what the Word of God says. There's a lot of unbiblical weirdness out there we've got to be careful of. Many people have gotten into bizarre, silly, ridiculous, and unbiblical activities. They try to pass it off as the Holy Spirit. Remember when the la Holy Laughter Movement went around and the barking like dogs, crowing like roosters. That was a movement of the Spirit, they said. No biblical evidence for that. So be very careful. Again, we stay within the parameters of God's Word to find out what this looks like, what this means, and so we want to be anointed, empowered by the Holy Spirit. Some say you're filled with the Spirit. Some say you're baptized in the Spirit. Pastor Chuck used to say, I don't care what you call it, but are you experiencing it? Are you experiencing the fullness of the Holy Spirit upon your life? What do the Scriptures reveal about what happens when the Spirit comes upon a person? The best example is Jesus, because Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist. The Spirit of God, the Lord came upon him, and that's when his ministry began. So what did that look like? Well, he tells us what it looks like. Look at this verse in Luke 4, verses 18 and 19. Jesus takes the scroll of Isaiah, and he quotes himself in the Old Testament, saying, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, E-P-I, Epi, overflowing with the Spirit, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. That's one of the evidences of being filled with the Spirit. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And based on that, I see, certainly don't see any reason why we should fear the fullness of the Holy Spirit. He's not going to turn you into a weirdo. He's going to turn you into being more like Jesus. We're see, like John the Baptist said, i got to decrease, Jesus must increase. That's what we want to be seeing the Lord increase in our lives. And so as we go through the book of Acts, we'll see people filled, and then we'll hear about them being refilled with the Spirit. Peter being filled with the Spirit. And then later on, Peter being filled with the Spirit. In other words, they're being refilled with the Holy Spirit. D.L. Moody used to say, you know, I talk about being refilled because I leak. We do. I'm not always like, yay, Jesus. There are times I'm like, ugh, this life stinks. I'm ready to get out of here. And so you got to be refilled. you got to be re-energized by the Holy Spirit. He's the one that motivates us, encourages us. When we're facing trials and struggles and hardships, He's the one that gives us peace and joy in the midst of what we're going through. As we'll see in the coming weeks, there's nothing to be fearful of. There's nothing weird or bizarre. Just common people like us were used by God to do extraordinary things for God because they allowed the Holy Spirit to work in them and through them for His glory. It's not about us and people looking to us, but it's us reflecting more of who Jesus is. So keep that in mind. So, not many days from now, he says, you're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Verse 6, Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, Will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Uh, this is interesting because even now they're wondering, are you going to set up the kingdom of God on earth? Is it now you're going to do this? Are you going to start ruling and reigning from Jerusalem? Are you going to establish the kingdom of God right now? Are you going to go into this thousand-year millennial reign like the Old Testament prophets spoke of? I can't get down on them for wanting this to happen soon. I mean, I want Jesus to come back today. Today would be a great day for the rapture. <laughs> I think it would be awesome. 
wouldn't it be amazing? Here comes the youth group coming through Las Vegas, and all of a sudden the van's empty. The van just could brrr, brrr, crashes and burns. Everybody, like, what happened? I don't know how many people in Las Vegas would go up, but probably quite a few. But it'd be an awesome testimony, an awesome witness. We all go up to be with the Lord in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Now, don't get me wrong. I love the life that God has given me. It's awesome being a Christian, uh, being brought out of darkness into his glorious light, being set free from all the stuff I used to be involved with. My life has been radically changed. But if, it, you know, if it's this good now, walking with Jesus, how much better is it going to be when we see him face to face? And we're walking in his presence in our glorified bodies. This is why Paul says, Eye has not seen, ears not heard, neither has entered the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those who love him. He goes on to say, But the Holy Spirit's given us a glimpse of these things. But like Paul will say in 1 Corinthians 13, Now we see through a glass or a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I'll know fully, even as I'm fully known. And so the best is yet to come. So, is it at this time, Lord, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Are you going to set it up right now? Verse 7, and he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. First of all, Jesus did not say, No, I'm not going to do that. What he's saying is, Not yet. Not yet am I going to do that. In other words, Jesus will keep all of his promises to the Jewish people, the kingdom of God will be fulfilled concerning the nation and the people of Israel when he returns at a second coming, Romans 11, 25, and 26 says, all Israel will be saved. They will recognize that is our Messiah and they will all turn to the Lord and then he will establish his kingdom from Jerusalem. They will experience all the promises that God gave them in the Old Testament about Israel. And it'll go all the way past present-day Jordan. And it's a huge area that they've never fully occupied. It's God's land. But they have not experienced all that God has had for them. But make no mistake about it, God is not done with Israel. And so, be careful of those that talk about replacement theology. Oh, God's done with them. They had, they had their shot. They blew it. They didn't receive Jesus, so he cut them off. He's done with them. No. They will come back to the Lord. And I hopefully God will use these trials and tribulations they're going through now and then into the great tribulation to turn their heart fully to the Lord. But in fact, if God does not keep his promises to the Jewish people, which almost half of all the prophecies in the Old Testament concerning the Israelites is about their future kingdom, if he doesn't fulfill those, then there's no guarantee he'll fulfill all the promises he has for you and me today. And so we cannot replace Israel. God is not done with them yet. They're on hold, so to speak. Remember the 77s of Daniel, 70 weeks of Daniel. 69 of those 70 weeks have taken place. That final week or seven-year period is still future. So right now, we're in the kingdom, or not the kingdom, we're in the age of grace where God is taking Jews and Gentiles, creating his church. But it's because he keeps his promises to Israel that we have confidence he'll keep his promises to us. At this moment, the disciples did not know God's plan that he's going to save us Gentiles. They didn't realize there's almost 2,000 years before Jesus starts the clock over with the Jews. But this is the church age where God is saving millions upon millions of people so a good thing he didn't establish his kingdom back then because none of us would even be here. And so God is not done with us. Now, again, they had no clue what God was going to do in these coming years. But God knows what's, when it's all going to come to an end. And I believe we're getting very close to the end. But the important thing is to keep trusting the Lord, keep walking with the Lord. Occupy until I come, Jesus says. In other words, be about the Father's business. Because we don't know the moment the rapture is going to take place. we got to live each day as if it could happen today, but plan your life as if you got the rest of your life ahead of you. That was what Pastor Chuck used to always encourage us. He goes, the rapture could happen at any moment. So live as if he could come back today, but plan because we don't know when. And so we don't go sit on a mountaintop like, okay, maybe today. 
No, he still has us here because he wants us to be about the Father's business, preaching the gospel, reaching out to the brokenhearted, preaching good news to those who are lost. We need to let people know Jesus is alive, risen from the dead. And so we don't just twiddle our thumbs sitting in a corner, but we continue to be light and salt to the world around us until that moment he takes us home. Now, again, there are people perishing all around us. They need to see the light of Jesus. And if you're like me, you can become easily intimidated. You can become, um, I don't know, shy, withdrawn. You can say, eh, I don't know if I should talk to that person about Jesus. And we can talk ourselves out of being a witness. Well, the, the answer, if you feel like, I can't do this. I, I can't be light. I can't be salt. I'm timid. I'm afraid. The answer is being filled with the Spirit. Because he washes in, you know, washes you clean. He flows into you. He's the one that empowers you to live out your life for him. And so here's the answer. If you're feeling like, man, I'm intimidated. Again, up to this point, that's how the apostles were. And these early disciples. We don't know if we can do this. He wants us to go in all the world and make disciples. We can't do that. So he tells them, verse 8, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Now, they already had the Holy Spirit in them when he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Now he says, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me. The word witness there is martis, where we get the word for martyr. You're going to be a living martyr, dead to yourself, but alive to Christ. And you might even have actually die for your witness of Christ. So you shall be witnesses to me. Here's the pattern we see throughout the book of Acts. In Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria. Samaria was the half-breeds. The Jews didn't want to go to Samaria. We don't like those Samaritans. They're half Jewish, half Gentile. We don't, we're going to stay away from those people. No, Jesus says, no, you're going to reach out to Samaria and to the end of the earth. And so how is that possible? When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and then you have the love of Jesus working in you and through you to reach those people that you don't like. To love people you don't even want to hang around with. So this is not only the book of uh, outline for the book of Acts, this is a key for the ongoing ministry of the Holy Spirit in our lives today. You'll receive power. It's not just power to go out witnessing about Jesus. That's part of it. But it's to be a witness, he says here, to me, literally means a witness of me. In other words, it's not just talking about Jesus to others, but it's also being an example wherever you are. At your work, are you an example to those around you? Do they see Jesus at work in you? Are, there, are you standing out as somebody that's different because the Holy Spirit's working in you and through you? So it's not just telling people about Jesus, it's representing him to those around you. The greatest power the Holy Spirit can give any of us, it's not miraculous power, it's power to love. Jesus, is that, he's the one that said it in John 13, 34. The world will know that you're my disciples by the love you have for one another. Not by the tongues you speak in, not by the miracles God does through you, but it's through the love of Jesus, agape love. God's love is what holds things together in this world of chaos. I can't say I've seen money hold a family together. I can't say I've seen miracles hold a marriage together, but I've seen God's love hold families and marriages together. After speaking about the gifts of the Holy Spirit in 1 Corinthians 12, Paul then says, let me show you the more excellent way. What's more excellent than the gifts of the Spirit? The fruit of the Spirit, love. He says there in 1 Corinthians 13, 1, Though I speak with the tongue of men and of angels, gift of tongues, but have not love, I'm nothing but a noisy gong and a clanging cymbal. Without love, God's love in your life, all the gifts are meaningless. They profit nothing, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. So when you put all this together, you see that the greatest evidence that the power of the Holy Spirit has come upon your life 
is that you will be witness, a living martyr, a living testimony of the love of Jesus to those around you. And as we go through the book of Acts, we see time and time again, it was the love of Christ that motivated them, that constrained them to continue to tell these wicked sinners that Jesus loves them, that he wants to set them free. He wants to turn their hearts away from these dead idols to the living God. It was the love that constrained them, the love of Jesus working in them and through them. So always keep that in mind because so many people get hung up on, we just want to see miraculous stuff. Well, you know where I see a lot of miraculous stuff? India. God's doing miraculous stuff in our midst here, but he's doing miraculous stuff in India. When you go to Northeast India and you're in these tribal villages and never heard about Jesus and they get saved, they can turn from death to life, from darkness to light. That's a miracle. That's the greatest miracle of all. Somebody that was dead in their sins and now alive in Christ and they know they're going to heaven. No greater miracle than that. So don't ever lose sight of the fact that God is still at work. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he who began a good work in us will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. So let's close in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your amazing grace. We thank you that you can use simple people like us to do extraordinary things for the kingdom of God as we walk in the Spirit and not in our flesh. Lord, help us to see all that you have for us. Because, Lord, apart from you, we can do nothing. But as Paul tells the Philippians, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And so, Lord, I do pray for all my brothers and sisters that are here this morning that we would seek your face, we would draw near to you, we would allow your Holy Spirit to do what he wants to do in us and through us. To make us more like Jesus, Lord, that's what we all desire. That's what we all need. Because we want to see the world around us the way you do. With love, with compassion, walking in truth and righteousness, not compromising with the world around us, but letting our light so shine before men that they might see our good works and give you the glory, because you, Father, are alone worthy to receive all the praise. And so, Father, may we decrease, may you increase. May your Spirit come upon us afresh and anew. Lord, if the rivers of living water are not pouring into our lives and flowing out of our lives, I pray that we would humble ourselves before you and we would stay under that spout where the blessings pour out. And, and Lord, we would allow you to work in us and through us so that t people can taste and see that the Lord is good. He's gracious. He's merciful full of love and compassion, desiring to set captives free and open blind eyes and set at liberty those who are oppressed. And so, Lord, give us the strength, give us the, the, the desire to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ to those around us who are lost, who are dying in our sins. Help us, Jesus, just to represent you in a better way, in a greater way as we live in this fallen world. Again, we can't do it on our own. And so we just ask that you would refresh us and refill us even now. Like Paul says, having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect in the flesh? God forbid. There's no way we could, Lord. And so we look to you. We humble ourselves before you and we thank you for the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit. Because you're continuing to do the work in our lives and you will finish your work in each one of us. And the day will come and we will stand in your presence. And hopefully we will all hear you say to each one of us, Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. And what a glorious day that will be. And so thank you, Jesus, for this time together. May you be blessed and glorified in all that we say and do this coming week. Search our hearts. Try us, Lord. See if there's a wicked way in us. And lead us in the way of everlasting life. 
And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together. Let's worship the Lord. As always, if you need prayer, please come on down. We'd love to pray with you and encourage you in Christ. Maybe you feel spiritually drained today. Well, the Lord wants to fill you up, and I encourage you to come on down. We'd love to pray with you and just see what God wants to do in your life.